Oh hey, this is Matt Fetcher from Audio Kit. Let's get started. What is up? Today we have an interview with Paul Batchelor, creator of Sound Pipe and Sports and recent South by Southwest award winner. I think that's one of the cool things about, about audio programming is that you debug with your ears. He's a musician turned developer and his code is used by millions of people daily. So let's get started. Hey everybody, my name is Paul. I'm one of the core developers here at AudioKit. I maintain, develop uh, S Soundpipe and Sporf, which are two utilities that are used inside of AudioKit. I uh, consider myself a music technologist, so uh, kind of at the intersection of music and technology. I have a musical background. I like to explore what technology can do for music and what music can do for technology. Awesome, Paul. It's so exciting to have you here to talk about all this stuff. And for people watching, you actually have a, a music degree. Yeah, I have a BM from Berklee College of Music in Boston, Massachusetts. Went through their electronic production design program. Every person at Berkeley has to have an instrument. So I studied jazz bass, upright bass. I have a, a master an MA from uh, Karma. So it's, it's a master of arts, which is really funny if you look at the program because it's very STEM heavy. So it's from Karma, which is the Center for Computer Research and Music and Acoustics. about how you got into AudioKit. And luckily we have someone very special that remembers. Uh, yeah, so I guess um, I met Paul right around uh, AudioKit version 2.1. It was the summer of 2015. Uh, AudioKit was using C Sound as its engine at the time and Nick Arner discovered this thing called Soundpipe made by Paul and uh, arranged for Nick, Paul and I to have a Skype session discussing how AudioKit could, could use a Soundpipe. And uh, Paul was really enthusiastic right away, basically saying anything CSUN could do, Soundpipe could do better, or at least just as well. And it's amazing because you're an actual musician that you use the code to make music. Soundpipe was created out of your necessity to have a library for your own music. Oh, absolutely. And this is, this is uh, an important aspect. You know, all of what I do with programming, it's really, it's the music that drives the programming. It was never really my intention to be a programmer. I didn't really think I was up for the task. I didn't think I was smart enough. I didn't think I, I knew the math, enough math to do programming. That was my mindset. But um, over the, the, the years of, of being at, at, at Berkeley, I, I, you know, I, I somehow managed to pick it up. And my motivation really, uh, I, I stopped thinking about, oh, I wasn't good enough to, I wasn't smart enough, I'm not studying programming. And it really was, all the things I built were just motivated by me wanting to build music and to create music. I definitely approach it from that angle. I think one of the things that makes today's interview so interesting is that Paul was kind of educated the reverse way from a lot of audio programmers. Paul's actually a musician first and uses technology to make his music. You don't actually have to use AudioKit to use Soundpipe. Oh, not at all. Um, yeah, Soundpipe stands on its own. It has its own repository on, on GitHub, and uh, people use it everywhere from AudioKit to you know Android to embedded people. People use it in embedded systems. There's a company, uh, your rat company right now, Qubit Electronics, and they're using some Soundpipe code in some of their digital modules. So it, it really goes everywhere. So what's the difference between Soundpipe and Sporth? Yeah, so Sporth is a language. It's a stack-based language I wrote after Soundpipe. Um, it's built on top of Soundpipe. So my motivation for writing Sporth was really, after I wrote Soundpipe, I was really convinced for a very short period of time that I could write music in C and I could write compositions in C. And I really like liked that the idea of being able to be like a musician who, can, who writes all his code in C. And in reality, it didn't work out so well because uh, for every musical idea I had, there were several dozens of lines of code I had to, to manipulate. And it just wasn't conducive to uh, creative flow. So I wrote Sporth as shorthand for describing some of the musical systems I wanted. Uh, and that was really why it existed, because I didn't want to, to keep writing C code, and I knew it wasn't going to be sustainable. Fourth has a, uses what's known as reverse Polish notation. Arguments precede function calls, and this works really well for describing audio systems that go from left to right that are highly serial. So um, as a result, I was able to really build really complex signal flows using Sporth and something no la larger than a tweet. And it was very satisfying and gratifying to work with. And I could write it much faster than I could uh, C code. Wow, that's truly amazing. And for those watching, if that went like half over your head, <laughs> uh, don't worry, you can still use Soundpipe and AudioKit with Swift. For example, mm -hmm. the Analog Synth X example, that's just a simple synth synthesizer. It uses Soundpipe for the oscillators and it sounds great. 
and you can control these oscillators just with the audio kit syntax. Right. So, you know, don't worry if you're not as smart, smart as Paul here. <laughs> well, that's another point that, that, I mean, that, that like, you know, working with soundpipe, sometimes it's, it's not ideal to work in things in just the soundpipe level. You need an audio kit. You need something on top of that in order to be creative because there's, there's just so much you're, you're fighting otherwise and complexity that you're, you don't want to deal with. That's really incredible. And yeah. so what gravitated you to building frameworks versus building apps? Because it's not as glamorous. I mean, what you do powers hundreds of apps on the app store, and yet people may not even know that you're the person behind all this. I guess the way I'd approach it is the reason, like I build tools to make things. I, I, I build tools to make, I build things to make things. Uh, and I guess that really all started with, uh, with CSAMP in college and doing something for music was actually uh, writing programs to, to write CSAMP code for me, CSAMP score statements. And that became, you know, this is something that, you know, someone around that age always gets interested in is this idea of, oh, I can write programs to write music for me. And that idea was kind of very romantic for me at the time because, you know, I was studying, you know, harmony and counterpoint and I was learning all these musical rules and, you know, surely there's, there could be something that the computer could do to speed things up. And there's something kind of rewarding about building a tool like that. And so you can easily get sucked into like, oh, I'm gonna build a tool that does this and I'm gonna, I'm gonna expand upon that, so. And, but, and I love your passion and you're yeah. probably inspiring other people thinking, oh my gosh, I need to write my own framework. So do you have any advice for people who wanna write their own music framework? I think the best thing I did with Soundpipe was really think about the future, like be really think very carefully about how it was going to grow and to compensate for unexpected changes and think about things that it wasn't going to do. So for Soundpipe, I knew it was going to grow to about the size it is today. I made a choice then and there that I wouldn't focus on the hardware aspects. So it would only be about adding and subtracting numbers, crunching numbers together, the actual DSP, but the actual getting the real time stuff out of the speakers, you know, getting the platform specific stuff was not a focus of sound. Like, um, and keep staying true to that was important. So be, being careful and thoughtful in what you design, because you're going to be using this it, it, for a period of time. And for me, uh, I'm going to be using Soundpipe for quite a while. So thinking very deeply about that is important. Um, and not jumping in uh, would be the advice. I That's guess. really great advice. Thanks. After you went through that whole experience at Karma, um, where a lot of important computer music was like invented, what did you learn there and how has it changed your approach or outlook? Yeah, so I guess to give you some context about, you know, wh where I was when I left Berkeley, um, I had a very good notion of, of how to make sounds, like how to connect modules together, you know, of synthesis fundamentals and, you know, these sorts of things. Uh, and I even knew how to like do a little bit of audio programming a little bit and to actually implement some of these things that I liked. But there wasn't really uh, a mathematical foundation. Like I, I always felt like after Berkeley, like I didn't feel like I knew actually how these filters worked. I didn't know how oscillators worked. It wasn't something I understood. It's just something I understood from a black box perspective in the sense that, oh, I plugged this into this and I could get this sound. And I was very good at that, like patch dictation. Like I was very good at reproducing sounds and reverse engineering them. So Stanford program that I went into was uh, very rigorous with the maths and sciences, uh, which was something I didn't have at Berkeley. So I actually got to learn a little bit about, you know, okay, mathematically, how do these filters work? When you do an FFT, I, I used FFTs all the time, uh, but like, why do they work? Why does it work? And what's the, what's the mathematical formula and the algorithm behind that, the DFT? And so I got, I got that uh, more technical perspective, more technical than, than I was already. And that was very helpful. So that's what I learned. I think, you know, uh, experientially, just like sitting next to uh, a bunch of, I, I sat next to a bunch of engineers and scientists uh, instead of a bunch of musicians at Berkeley. So that was a different change of pace for me, being around these different people who just think and see the world very differently. So that was helpful. And uh, yeah, being around some of these, these old school guys, you know, uh, like J Julius Smith, uh, you know, being around Go Wong, and, and well, uh, but definitely, but you know, var varying ages, uh, but, but you know, uh, but like, like, like those guys, like, I mean, 
they, they've, well, Julius has been around, uh, you know, he, he worked on the DSP systems with the next cube and he knew Steve jobs and, you know, everybody in the industry knows who Julius is. He's on a first name, you know, he's kind of a first name guy. Uh, so, you know, learning, you know, the, the legacy that, that Stanford has for all this, this, this cool computer music was really cool to just absorb and be around because they're still around. I mean, it's such a, like, the, the, that's the cool thing about computer music is that no one's dead yet. Not really. And so you can, you can see these legends uh, uh, alive that, that kind of shaped, uh, you know, computer music and just like electronic EDM music as well. Uh, and that's just, that's just so cool um, how, how far we've come in such a short period of time. Indeed. And yeah. do you think being around all these legends is what inspires you to release your code as open source following in the footsteps of giants? Well, I don't know what, what came first, but I mean, that's what the giants did. But I don't think that's why I did it uh, initially. For years, I, I relied on open source projects and, you know, I, I use these tools. And I think open sourcing my stuff is a way of giving back. But I think it really is better. I think they're, they're, I, I really like transparency in software. And I really like, learn, like I've learned so much from others because I could look at their code and study it. And I feel like it's just all like I should return the favor and, and continue the growth and inspire others and help others to learn. What drew you to the AudioKit community of audio developers? Well, AudioKit found me, um, and I'm glad they did, because, uh, you know, it's when you are doing the kinds of things that I'm doing, uh, it can be a very isolating experience. And, you know, it's never good to work in a vacuum. You know, Soundpipe wouldn't have been the thing it is today had it not been for Ari sort of uh, pushing me, lighting a fire, being enthusiastic about what I do and, you know, encourage me, encouraging me to continue working on, you know, actually having people use your software is such a, it's like, you never expect it. Like I write software for me because I was, I'm doing compositions and I'm so seeing other people use it is such a wonderful thing. And, and it's, it's such an inspiring thing. It encourages me to work even harder than I did before. I'm really thankful for, for audio kit for you know, giving me that opportunity and giving me that, that chance uh, and, and having, having a place to be heard. And to this day, I'm still getting lots of emails about asking about Sandpipe, asking about Sporth, and they're all from, can be traced back to, to AudioKit. So it's done tremendous things for my projects. And it sort of validates too what you're doing because when you're working alone in isolation, you don't know what works and what doesn't, and you don't even know if it's worthwhile uh, most of the time. It's a very hard question to answer because you can try to think back about like what inspired you to open source at the beginning but it's actually a lot more interesting of an answer to say what happened since you open sourced it like i wouldn't have met you i wouldn't have met you i wouldn't have met anybody who i you know, any of the top 20 people in my life right now very well said uh you know you'd be on my myspace top 20 as well <laughs> thanks <laughs> yeah I, I definitely have a lot of bug reports uh that i wouldn't have found otherwise um yeah. It's amazing the kind of uh, ear training that you get being an audio framework developer because every once in a while I hear this little tiny click and it was like driving me crazy because maybe every like 30 seconds or something I would hear this click and I would tell it to Paul and Paul would look at the code and say, no, it can't be. It must be something on, on the Apple side or you know, on your computer or something. Yeah, oscillators are way less noisy now thanks to, to Ari. That was, that, was a, that was a tedious one. I think, I think that's one of the cool things about, about audio programming is that you debug with your ears. I love those. Like anytime there, there's a bug or something, um, I often say post an audio recording of it because it actually you can kind of hear, oh, okay, this, this is garbage. Okay, that sounds like, you know, uninitialized variables or like, oh, there's a click here. There's like an off by one error happening. Uh, and, and you begin, you train yourself to hear these little common audio DSP mistakes. Uh, you know, oh, this, this is, uh, it, it, it fizzles out. So there's some coefficient wrong in your, in your code that you implement. That's one of the, that's, that's, it's really nice uh, to train your ears for that. It's a lot of fun. Um. I always lament the fact that audio programmers and audio development seems to be a little bit behind the times when skeuomorphism was dropped on all Apple products, except like GarageBand is still highly skeuomorphic. 
musicians and audio developers, we seem to hang on to the past. We're constantly making emulations of synthesizers rather than like thinking of brand new things. I think the audio community very much started out as being a, a technophobic community. So a lot of the early UI considerations were very schemorphic. So, you know, knobs and sliders were based on consoles. Uh, you know, piano rolls, you know, piano rolls did exist for player pianos and they look just the same. Uh, and so we've, we've got all these, these technologies that are, are based on analog counterparts. The art communities tend to, to be conservative in, some, in many regards because there is a tradition. You know, if you're a, a composer, you know, you study, you know, Bach and Mozart. And, you know, if you're a jazz guy, you're transcribing, you know, Charlie Parker solos. And if you're a bass player like I was, I was, you know, you know, Paul Chambers and, and stuff like that and, and analyzing his solos and bass lines too. And just transcribing a lot of bass lines. It's understandable why our, our, our community is a little behind the times. It's just because it's just of how, because we, we're, we're so, we care so much about what's in the past. I always think about backwards compatibility and, and you know, making sure things don't become corrupt with, with bit rot in, this, in the way. So I guess an example of that would be, um, you know, C-Sound. Uh, you know, uh, one of the things that is very interesting about C-Sound is that um, they're very serious about backwards compatibility to the point that, you know, uh, their bug fixes, uh, they won't accept some certain bug fixes for older opcodes uh, because uh, uh, some composer 10 years back might be using that that particular bug for as part of their composition. Um, and I think, you know, that, that happened to Ari a few times uh, where there were certain bug fixes. Uh, is that right? They would reject uh, actual terrible bugs that I would report because they could possibly change the sound output of an old yeah. composition, which I had a issue with. We're still in an infancy with computer music. People think about like the golden ages well, they were 30 years ago. Paul just said most of the people are still alive. It's not old enough to be so revered as it is. I think we right. need to move forward and stop emulating synths and things like that. And, so, right. and certainly right. part of that is fixing your bugs so that the future generations, which I feel are the important generations, are the ones who are getting easier to use code rather than honoring the legacy of a guy who's only 65 now. Like That's not a legacy yet. Right. Right. I think it's, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Uh, it's an interesting thing from a software point of view, like which, which, how much do you respect in terms of API design or de like design of opcodes and, and what the balance is. And you guys have both very eloquently and profoundly explained the past of music frameworks. Where do you think the future is going? Where are we two years from now? Where are we four years from now? I'd like yeah. to hear from both of you on this. Yeah. Uh, you want to go first, Ari, and I'll copy you. <laughs> Uh, no, I, I think you're the main interview subject. You got to go first. Okay. At my level, what I do, I work very close to the metal uh, in languages like C and C++. A rival to those languages is, is Rust. I can definitely see a lot of uh, new projects being taken on that use uh, Rust or something in, instead in place of, of those languages. For DSP, big fan of Faust, which is a, another language. It's a functional audio language. It's been around for 10 years. You know, that tool... I'm hoping it, it, it gets more popular. Um, it's, it's a very nice tool. For higher level, like sort of the audio kit side of things, I think we're going to see a, a large change and in, in, in better, better uh, improvements to tools like audio kit, uh, tools that enable people to build the apps and synthesizers that they want without having to learn all the nitty gritty details. That's, that's what I got. What do you think, Ari? So I don't think we're going to see anything happen unless some punk rock attitude is adopted in this in this uh, field because we have the ability to make music be very different. And if we spend our time uh, just coming out with like new DAWs and new synths and new th that aren't pushing the envelope, then in two, four years, not much is going to change. But if we uh, work on the frameworks and make it easier for people to do brand new things and just think of things we never would have because we have a background in this field. That's our hope for like what could possibly be different. So I don't know what's going to happen in two to four years. Our responsibility to make it easier for those people who are going to be truly innovative to have the tools they need to get that done. I think it's a, it's a very tough question to answer uh, without calling out everyone to just do more interesting things with what 
with their capabilities, with their programming abilities. So it's interesting that you bring that up. No more synth examples. As we've been working on this giant, huge open source synth project for the last two years. Well, but you just said it. It's open source. That's what makes it punk rock. Because we're not just coming out with the synth and saying, here, you can use our tool to make sounds. We actually are saying, here is a base for you to learn how this was made, how to create your own. There's no limit to what you can do, uh, which you can change the, the synth for releasing to be completely your own, completely different. So by making, just by making it open source, we are being a hell of a lot more interesting than if Arturia or Moog or any of these great companies come out with a new synth that you can just use on your, on your iPad versus, versus reprogram if you want to. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tag right on onto that uh, and say, uh, you know, with SoundPipe, you know, the fact that it's open source is really exciting uh, because, you know, I always intended to build SoundPipe to eventually decompose and to eventually, like, not be a library anymore. And so, uh, like, it really is built for people to open up and read and study uh, these these really great algorithms that I'm, I'm kind of taking from... Uh, really good languages. It's just, you know, shoulders upon shoulders of giants, if you will. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's totally punk rock, you know, um, you know, bringing it, you know, just like, you know, just like taking, taking these tools that you wouldn't otherwise know how they work and then, and then being able to use them and, and, and learn from them and build on top of them. Just one day I was reading about South by Southwest and sure enough, there was Paul and there was Paul winning an award. And like, of course, of course, Paul would be winning an award at South by Southwest, but how awesome it is just to randomly find that one of the core team members is just out, out changing the world. So yeah, right after Stanford, I got a summer internship at Microsoft Research and kind of taking a music designer sort of role, building with the Enable group, uh, which is a group just uh, at research group at Microsoft dedicated towards kind of building accessibility technology and technology to help people with, with certain conditions and work with computers better and to improve their lives. Specifically, uh, their scope for now is really with uh, ALS, which is a neuromuscular disease you get where uh, you slowly lose control of all your body. And eventually you lose the control to breathe and you die. And it's probably one of the the worst uh, diseases you can get. And um, I was brought on specifically to work with Jeremy, who's uh, an individual with ALS, who kind of is associated with Microsoft Research. And they wanted me to uh, come and build musical interfaces for him uh, that he could play with. He is a musician, you know, when he, uh, but he got ALS and so he wasn't able to play music in the traditional way. Uh, I came in there to see if, what I could do about it and to build some prototypes for him. You lose control of your body, uh, but one of the last things that goes is the ability to control your eye. As a result, you, you have all these eye trackers and eye tracking technology used with Windows to do, simulate mouse clicks by like kind of looking at places and for periods of time. Uh, and they call that uh, gaze-based technology. So you're gazing at something and uh, you know, it simulates a mouse click. So uh, what I built for him was uh, sort of uh, something like Ableton Live. It was sort of a, a clip launcher for the eyes. I built also some other smaller uh, little applets for him to, to work with um, that allowed him to perform. And uh, this piece of software, this, this prototype, along with um, a few other tools, uh, one of the, the big things they were working on was sort of a, a drum sequencer uh, that he could, that Jeremy control, could control and actually uh, it would perform real drums. So there'd be solenoids and like things through, that would communicate through MIDI and hit real drums. And so uh, the, this, this, my project and this project and another project got kind of grouped together and submitted uh, as a submission for South by Southwest Interactive uh, for the uh, Innovation Awards. And uh, they, they let us in and uh, they gave us the award, uh, which was uh, really exciting for everyone um, and really cool. A hell of a way to finish an internship. So it was, it was a really cool experience. You know, you don't always get to work on things that uh, improve people's lives. Microsoft even let you open source some of it, didn't they? Yeah, they, they let me open source all of my project, which is really cool. Uh, it was called iJam Internally, uh, and that's what I call it on my website. But the project's official name that went through legal is uh, 
Microsoft Hands-Free Sound Jam. And so you can find Microsoft Hands-Free Sound Jam on GitHub. Uh, and you can see I'm using a lot of Soundpipe and, and stuff and other open source tools on the hood. Do you have any final thoughts that you want to leave the audience with? I want to speak to the, the, um, the types like me, the musicians do, who don't have a, like a CS degree and have that constant insecurity to just keep going for it and just to keep trying. You're on the right track. And to remember that, you know, the thing that, that separates musicians like getting into programming versus programmers getting into music is that musicians have a way of asking the right questions. And, and implementing the right answers. And that's super important. I do want to call attention to, like Paul mentioned that you don't have to be good at math. And uh, math is not uh, numbers and arithmetic like people are taught. It's, it's a language for describing things. And people who consider themselves good at writing often don't consider themselves good at math, but there's two ways of explaining things to people. And programming is just explaining to the computer what it needs to do. And I don't, I don't think that there's any reason for musicians to be afraid of coding and to think that they're not good at, they were, they got bad grades in math, that that means that they can't code because it's a completely different thing. And especially as languages are getting more accessible and more Englishy, you know, you can read audio kit code and understand what it's going to do. And that, then you get into a slippery slope where you can you understand what's happening in Swift, but you need to make some change at the DSP level. So you introduce yourself to a little bit of C, say, oh, this is not so bad. It ends up being not nearly as daunting as you might think. Yeah. Oh, another, another addendum to the addendum. Uh, something that Ari and I both talk about a lot. Uh, nobody knows what they're doing when it comes to audio programming. So like, they really don't. They, you know, and if they, they say they do, they're lying. Thanks to Paul and Ari for this amazing interview. You can catch more at audiokitpro.com. This has been Matthew Fetcher. Thanks for watching. AudioKit is a free and open source project. You can learn more at audiokitpro.com.